everyone. You're watching Soundwaves TV. Chasta here, and I'm so excited to have on the line two true legends. Do you guys ever get tired of hearing that word? Because I'm sure that's all you ever hear. <laughs> it's yeah. Danny Korchmar and Wadi Waktel, two members of the immediate family. Thank you for taking the time with me today. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. This is so this is so cool. Um, we're doing this, we're having this chat because a fantastic music documentary came out. Um, and I watched it, I've actually watched it twice now. Uh, fell in love with it. And uh it it was su it's such an important documentary because of course we started with the wrecking crew, same guy directed both uh documentaries. I do want to mention though, there were five members, our five members of the immediate family. So the ones that are not with us on this call today are Russ Kunkel, Leland Sklar, and Steve Postel. Um and so I, I do just out of the gate want to make sure that everyone knows they can watch this film on Amazon Prime or Apple TV. Uh, very easy to access and and such a great time. I talk about it all the on the air all the time because of course, uh, the Bonehead family were a bunch of musical nerds and musical lovers. So things like this really, really speak to us. So obviously, you guys have worked with literally everybody, and and there's a million places we could start here. Uh, I do want to mention just kind of rattling it off some names. And by the way, in no particular order, and I'm going to read these because I'm going to make sure I, I get a lot of them right. Uh, Stevie Nicks, Keith Richards, Carol King, James Taylor, Don Henley, Phil Collins, Jackson Brown. This list is just mind boggling. Warren Zevon, Holland Oates, David Crosby, Linda Ronstadt, Lyle Lovett. I mean, Carol King, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, we could be here forever. But I thought, you know what? Let's start with an existential question here, uh, which is, you know, it, it amazes me when I see people like the two of you living your life and doing what you do. It truly to me feels like this is what you were born to do. Like this was destiny. Do you feel that way? Do you believe in that? Well, you know, speaking for myself, it's the only thing that mattered to me. And, uh, you know, I started playing when I was 10. By the time I was 12, I had learned you know, the, the three rock and roll chords with which you could play all the songs that you wanted. And at that point, it was all over. And, yeah. uh, and I was never looked back. So for me, I started, uh, I saw a guitar on television when I was five years old. And uh, that was my world. I, told, I looked at my mother and I said, what is that? What's, what's that guy holding? What is that? She said, that's a guitar. She said, that's, that's I said, that's what I want to do. She went, you're five years old. What are you talking about? But and that was it. And it took me till till I was nine to finally convince my father to give me a guitar teacher and a guitar. So and uh, th like Danny said, it was the only thing I ever thought of myself doing, really. Yeah, so. that is so cool. I have an eight year old uh, who's a drummer and oh. started drumming when he was a about six. Um, and it feels like that's what it is for him. You know, time will tell. Uh, and I certainly don't want to push him on it because I don't want him to go the opposite way. So you just kind of sit back as a parent and go, well, we'll see. <laughs> see how this plays out. Right. Hopefully. Hopefully so. Fingers crossed. Um, you know, you uh, I've been I've been doing radio for 22 years and the two of you uh, were in the studio and, and wrote on so many of the songs I play today. In fact, right before you popped on, I'm playing Dirty Laundry, Don Henley on uh, The Bone right now. Uh, so, you know, the, it's been a major part of my life being on the radio for 22 years. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews in that time, and it seems like a conversation that happens a lot is the idea of creativity. Um, and recently we've been talking about creativity sort of being an entity. Uh, there was there was a book that came out called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And she talks about creativity as sort of this entity that kind of lives up in this sphere and it passes by you. And you either grab it, you grab an idea as it comes to you or you don't. And sometimes that idea can land with someone else. Have you ever had that moment where you had an idea, you didn't run with it and you heard something and you go, wait, I had that idea first or I had that riff first. Well, I got to tell you, neither Wadi or I have written any books about creativity, so uh, we don't, <laughs> you should. We don't, we don't think about it that way. We just play, and yes, ideas come to you. Uh, Wadi will tell you that Keith Richards has an expression "incoming," which means he's he's getting an idea, you know, and something's yeah. coming in, and that to me that says it all right there. Uh, <laughs> you know, you play all the time, and suddenly magic comes to you, or an inspiration comes out of nowhere, yeah. and uh, off you go. It happens all, and, and it can happen in all kinds of levels too. I, when I was younger, I was in a band back east and uh, looking for a song to do, and I thought of uh, Bob Dylan's song "It Ain't Me, Babe." Mm -hmm. I thought of it, and thought of it, and the next thing I knew, there it was on the radio by the Turtles. Yeah. 
And I went, oh, man, well, there was a good idea that I didn't get a chance to jump on because these guys, someone else had the same idea. So it's exactly what you're talking about. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I had never heard it put that way. But when she described it like that, I feel like everybody's had that moment, you know, where they're like, oh, I had that. that I swear yeah. I thought of that. <laughs> Wait, a minute. Wait a minute. That was my idea. You know, <laughs> Just didn't run with it, didn't patent it <laughs> or whatever. I didn't know uh, where to go. Yeah, right. Wherever it goes. Well, it lands out there, you know, somewhere in the ether. Um, you know, you guys like going back to the wrecking crew, you know, one of the differences, main differences, there were several um, is, you know, you guys finally got credit, uh, you know, and, and you finally got your names on albums. And, and that's so important. I'm, I'm a lover of musicians. I'm married to a professional drummer. I remember very well being, you know, a five, six year old learning to read and sitting down with record sleeves and going through and figuring out who was playing what. You know, talk about that difference and that profound effect that it had on your lives. Well, um, that's wonderful, of course. You know, uh, I've known James my whole life, and uh, this is kind of what started it for me and Russ and Lee was playing on uh, uh, James's JT album and, and Carol's Tapestry. And yes, it's, it was an incredible thrill to have those things be discovered, those that music discovered by uh, um, everyone. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so it, it lit me up for sure and it lit all of us up because we all realized that, hey, we're part of something that's winning and it's getting over to people. So what's better than that? Yeah. And, yeah, and you're getting credited for it. That's the difference, you know. Yes. And also, that's right. Our names were on the record. Right. So people knew who we were and yeah. uh, that made a huge difference in our careers. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. We never had that luxury. And we, we owe that to Peter Asher as the one who decided names of the musicians have to go on the albums. Yeah. He was adamant about it, and uh, it's thanks to him that our names were on those records. Going going back across, you know, all of the names that I just rattled off, which is nowhere near a full list, um, just hitting the the tip of the iceberg. You know, what does it mean to you um, to be such a part of this legacy and the pop culture impact that you've had? And these songs that will last forever. I mean, what a beautiful legacy that when we're all dead and gone, musicians get to have this stay here. I'm jealous of that, not being a musician. All right. So uh, the thing is, the magic is in the doing, doing of it. Mm. Doing it is the most fun and the best part and the height of, of the whole experience. Reflecting on it is very nice. Having done it is very nice and it's terrific. And yes, we're all terribly proud of uh, the music that we've played on and all the people we've worked with and we, you know, but it's doing it. That's the real reward. It's so much fun and so great to play music with your pals and have it come out great. You listen to it back and it's, it's terrific. And it's, you know, nothing is better than that. No high is higher than, than that to me. Getting to be involved in the music and the creation of a song. And for Danny, Danny's written a lot of these hit songs that we all love and have heard a million times on the radio, but when you get in the studio with one of these great singers and you're there participating in their life, first of all, and you hear a song that you you instantly know that you can add something to it mm -hmm. and you're getting the chance to do that. It's an amazing reality when you go out in the studio, you have a singer like James or Linda out there with you and, and they're going for the real take. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, in the old days, it used to have what they'd call a singer would come in and sing the guide vocal. And uh, then the singer, the artist would then, when everyone was gone, would come in and put the real vocal on it. But uh, we used to do it the other way. Uh, the singer would be singing the take. And we, so everyone was playing the performance. Yeah. And uh, it's really exciting to do it that way. And, you know, it's more like actually you know, the old days when they had no other choice but to do it that way. Right. So that's it's funny that you bring that up, Wadi, because there is such a difference um, between playing it live where you're all playing in the studio or building it, starting from the foundation, from the drums and building in the layers. And it's funny because now you're seeing a lot of bands go go back, as they say, go back to doing it live and doing it all in the studio, because what they're trying to do is capture the energy that that environment brings. Is that yeah, what you yeah, said? Think yeah, I think young bands are, are discovering, first of all, the fun and the joy yeah. of sitting in a room and put, making something up together and having it and playing it down together, vocals and all. Then yeah. you really know what you have. Also, there's a, an element that happens when you play live with everybody that just does not happen uh, uh, 
when you do things piecemeal, one at a time. You mm -hmm. cannot possibly capture that same vibe as you do when everyone's yeah. playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another element of it is that when I was coming up, before even before I moved to Los Angeles, I was always thinking the record was the main focus. The record, you got to make that record, got to have that record. But you come to realize that the performing the song live is the real deal. Yeah. And the record is like, an, not an approximation, but it's the advertisement of what you do live. Yeah. It's to bring people in to see your show. And uh, so I came up with it backwards. I didn't realize that for a long time. And uh, from doing it in the studio the way we were doing it, you get to realize that that's the whole ticket, yeah. is performing it together. Yeah, absolutely. Sticking with the, the idea of energy, I mean, you guys were able to go out on the road, tour these songs, uh, and, and live live that life. Uh, studio life and obviously road life are two very, very, very different things. Uh, yeah. What are the pros and cons? And do you have a, a preference? I know it's kind of apples and oranges, but, you know, between the two. They're both fabulous. They're both great experiences, and they're both very different. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing like being in front of an audience, of course. You know, and anyone will tell you that because yeah, right, they give back to you, and, and, and uh, it's happening in real time in front of people, and, and you're getting a response in real time. So, what can be better? Sure. Uh, on the other hand, in recording, it's also incredibly great because it's just a different experience. You know. Yeah. Yeah. The idea, the idea of being in a room and coming up, you know, it's like. The speakers are the whole, the speakers run the show. You know, yeah. if it, you can all have a concept of what you want. You can all have an idea of how it should go. And it's, but as soon as you hear it back from those big speakers in the studio, then you know what's happening. And that's dictating exactly the reality of it. And it's just an incredible experience. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a fast learning experience, too. You instantly go, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. Shouldn't do that. Need to do this. And uh, it's wonderful. Unfortunately, the speakers don't lie. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so when you hear it, I've gone as a producer, I've gone in and I know, I'm being absolutely convinced that the parts I had or you know, most of them were going to work. Right. Yeah. No, no question about it. And then we listen to the first playback and I realize I'm wrong and I have to change it right now. In other yeah. words, you can't sit around and go, well, well uh, I, you know, no, you've got to adapt immediately. Yeah. And uh, because the speakers just told you you were wrong, you know, yeah. and yeah. then you got to listen to that and go and, and, and adapt quickly. Yeah, that feels like a lot of pressure. Coach, I'm glad you brought that up because there was a part in the movie that really stuck out to me. Um, it was said that you all were brought in to to play yourselves, to be yourselves. Uh, it wasn't like, OK, do it this way, do this part. Um, is that more or less pressure? that you don't have a directive that they're really relying on you to to be you or is it easier because it is you well it's it would, it would definitely the only way i can function is to is to be me you know i'm not one of the uh, the studio cats that can read anything read any music put in front of them play in any style i don't i can't play in any style i can only play in my style yeah. and uh, while i used to be able to sight read when i was a little boy doing taking music lessons uh, all we're usually given is is chord sheets is is, is uh you know what's called a lead sheet with just the chord changes yeah right now. so you got to make up your own stuff and that definitely is my comfort zone rather yeah. than try, try to be somebody else yeah. yeah i started out doing you know when i started doing sessions i would come in and there would be parts written out but i would kind of look at it and i would either suggest to the producer maybe i could do it this way mm -hmm. or i would <laughs> take a chance and just kind of ignore what they wanted and do it my way. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Uh, fortunately, a, a lot of the time it did work. And that's, like you said, that's why we started to get hired more and more and more to bring what we bring to a record yeah. rather than copy and exactly play what's written out. Yeah. Right. One, th one thing uh, I've, no one has ever said to me, and probably Wadi too, is can you sound just like so-and-so? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Can you play like, like Andy Summers? Can you play like, uh, you know, and the answer is no. <laughs> you, get, you can get anyone to do that. Go to Berkeley School of Music and tell some 18-year-old kid, play like Andy Summers, and he will. Yeah. I'll have all the post, uh, police parts wired. That's mm -hmm. not us, you know. Yeah. We make it as we go along. It's a different way of thinking. I love that way of thinking because to me, all I hear when you're talking is absolute confidence in who you are as a person and a performer. 
Um, you joke a little bit about in the movie about your your ego. Um, yes. Do you feel like that that really has helped you in your career being able to stand on your own two feet and go, no, nope, I think this is the way it should be done and, and having that confidence? Well, I can't stop myself and neither can I walk. <laughs> you, hear something, you, you hear something that you know could be better. Yeah. You cannot just sit there. It's impossible. I love that. that. Uh, you know, when I talked about having a big ego, my ego comes from being able to find a part that's going to help when I'm playing music with other people. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Find something that's going to help and that it's going to light up the drummer and the bass player and the singer and, and everyone. Yeah. That's where, that is, it, that fulfills my ego. Uh, and and that's, that's what we're all about, really. Buddy, what about you? No, that's exactly, uh, that's the ticket, what Danny just said. Yeah. That's what it's all about, is finding the part that works, sticking to it, and, and seeing the singer dig it, and the <laughs> producer. You know, you, you're there to satisfy these people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we try to satisfy ourselves, but, you know, again, if you, you come in with a part, and you, and you hear a part, and you think it's right, and the producer goes, I'm sorry, that's no good you got to instantly go, oh, okay, right, that's no good. What was I thinking? Yeah. And look for the right one. But finding the right one is the whole deal. It's, it's counterpoint. It's our life. You know, it's that melody. It's what's, it's what's happening when the singer isn't singing and the spaces are there, mm -hmm. how you fill those spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kind of do it. I try to do it melodically aside from rhythmically. Danny will do it more rhythmically than melodically. And uh, that's one reason we play so well together, you know. Kind of the yin and yang thing. So you really have to, if I'm hearing you right, you really have to have a balance of confidence and belief in yourself and your skills and knowing what you're doing, but also being malleable and, and being in that studio and being able to go, okay, if not this, then this. Well, if you're, yeah, if you're confident, you're not going to be thrown when somebody tells you, well, change your part or do this or right. something yeah. like that. At one yeah. point I was, I was producing Billy Joel and we were cutting the first track, which is a terrific track called No Man's Land. Really, really good rocking track. Waddy, you should check that one out. It's, it's one of the <laughs> best, best things he ever did. Oh, yeah. and so we're playing it in, and we're playing the first, uh, running down the first chorus and he says, uh, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, naturally, you know, my heart stopped. <laughs> and uh, so I had, um, uh, I had uh, T.M. Stevens, the, the bass player, play a low C instead of a high C, to go all the way down to the low C in the chorus, the first card of the chorus. And that changed, so the whole thing blossomed, and then he liked it. <laughs> so right. it's, it's usually something simple like that. Yeah, it doesn't take much. It right. doesn't. Wow. Right. Easily said from two legendary musicians. <laughs> Me over here, I'm like, oh, the panic that would go through my body in a moment. Well, like, <laughs> it went through mine, sure, you know, of course. Yeah. Uh, there's also a story kind of on that same idea, Wadi, I was dying laughing, the werewolves in London conversation where you were like, wait, doesn't it go like this? Can you, t <laughs> can you tell that story quickly? I think you're talking about how many times we tried to do it. Oh, um, yes, 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 yes. You know, I mean, it's a very simple, very simple song. It's got one lick and great lyrics and uh, three chords. But we, it was a matter of feel really. And uh, we would bring it and being in Los Angeles at that time and producing, I have Danny, I got Leland, I got Russell, I have Jeff Picaro, I've got Bob Glob, I've got Steve Lukather. We've got Jeff, we've got all the musicians you could ever want, you know, and so one by one, I put bands together to play werewolves. Mm -hmm. and, and I try it with Russell and Leland. And we tried it. And Warren and I are looking at each other going, eh, it's not right. Didn't feel it. So I tried it with Russell and Bob Glob. Still didn't feel right. Didn't feel right. It's not right. Jackson's going, that's pretty good. We're both going, eh, I don't know. It doesn't feel right. We tried it with Jeff Picaro and Bob. And then we tried it with Jeff and Lee. We tried it with Rick Schlosser. We tried it with Michael Botts. We tried it with so many combinations of bands. And it just felt light mm. to us didn't feel down and dirty to us. It just felt, and Warren said it, he said, it just feels comical, you know, and mm. the jokes don't work if it feels like, if the music feels like that, yeah. I can't, I can't say, it just doesn't feel like anything to me. I can't juxtapose these words against that. It doesn't have it. And our dearest friend, Jorge Calderon, was the one who said, what about Nick and John from Fleetwood Mac? And I went, oh, my God, those guys could lay this down. 
Mm -hmm. I know those guys could play this hard. So I called them. They were delighted to hear from us and wanted to do it. And we couldn't believe they said yes. <laughs> and that night they came over and we spent literally all night tracking it, like 60 takes or something like that, because Mick just wouldn't stop. And the story was on take two, Jackson said to me, he goes, why, that was pretty good. You want to hear it back? And Mick goes, nah, 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 let's just keep going, keep going, man. I went, oh, okay, fine, we'll keep going. You know, now it's like three, two, three, four in the morning. And it's like take 59, take 60. I went, all right, hold it. <laughs> Jackson, didn't take two feel good? He goes, yeah, you want to hear it? I went, yeah, I want to hear it. So we went in and listened to take two, and that's the record. And that's the one. Yeah, yeah of course. The but they had, they had the, the, the strength to lay that song, to ignore the jokes. Yeah. They just plowed through it like it was a serious rock and roll track. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for. So Warren could then sing it. Yeah, there's so much there. And you're right, Coach. I did I did screw up. Those are two stories. Everly Brothers was where you walked in and said it didn't sound or they weren't playing it right. Uh, and then the the Werewolves of London. Yeah. Yeah, those that's... those two moments really the, those stuck out to me. Um because why do you spend a lot of time telling people they didn't play it right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me included. It's not my fault. Yeah. It's not my fault. Spoken like true band brothers. If I, I will, you gotta, you gotta have that rapport, I guess, with each other. It helps. Yeah, uh, sixty times on one song is a lot. I mean, I, I know, you know, there's a lot of a hurry up and wait time as well in a studio because there is so many tinkering and and redoing of things. But what you just said, you know, really pointed out to me. I've always made the argument that sort of casual music fans will just listen to a song and they'll have this perception. I've had people say this thing to me and it drives me crazy. Like, you know, well, that's just a guitarist. Like any guitarist could make that sound. Not understanding that there is a significant difference from guitarist to guitarist, bassist to bassist and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And you can, I, can I interject something about, about oh. the uh, uh, Worlds in London? Um, Worlds uh, of London is that uh, the cats that Wadi was trying out are all great musicians. As sure, you yeah. Right. All session musicians. Right. So they spend every day trying to please someone else, someone else, someone else, someone else, someone else. Um, Fleetwood Mac, those two guys are Fleetwood Mac. They play in a rock and roll band and have done. They're rock and rollers from the ground up. They don't do date after date. They don't do Taco Bell commercials and some lame singer. And they don't do any of that. They just do what they do. And that's why they were able to come in there without any uh, hesitation. They just went, you know. And all the guys that I mentioned are all over the rest of the record. You know, there's right. the combinations of all those musicians. It's just that that particular song was like, it wouldn't lay down. It yeah. just wouldn't. It just sounded cute. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And those lyrics, like in the beginning, those just came to you, like just like that, like a flash, like a bolt of lightning. The first verse came to me. Yeah, That's Warren said, "We need to write this. We need to write this song." Where I was in London, I literally had just gotten back from being in London, having gone to Lee Ho Fuchs restaurant, yeah. having some beef chow mein. So. <laughs> I just spit the whole first verse out at Warren and he went, oh yeah, that's it. That's yeah, that's good. That's it. So it's basically journalism from your trip that you just took. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. travelog really. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. So because it's a wolf, yeah. we should do a Ao thing, you know, and, yeah. and our friend Roy Marinell had that lick, that main lick that you hear in that song. That's, that lick sat around for a year at least trying to put it in other songs and Finally, when Warren said, we got to write this song, I said, Roy, play that lick. Play that lick, that fucking lick already. <laughs> play the lick, and that was it. We just went and we started writing right from then. That goes back to the ma magic of music. I mean, it just blows my mind how some of these things come together like that. I mean, you guys have obviously, you've played your whole lives, as you're mentioning, from five, nine, ten, um, and you've played with everyone. You know, you guys are you're focused on the immediate family right now, this film and, and what you're doing together. Um, what's what's left for you to check off the bucket list? Like, who else would you want to play with? What else would you want to do? You've had such an incredible career, all of you. Like, what's next? Another good, another good song. Yeah, <laughs> always another good song. Followed by another one. Yeah. Another good record, you know. Yes. That's uh, that's it. That's the name of the game. You know, getting hired. Yeah. That's the thing to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
That's so yeah. real. What if on on that uh, idea, what advice do you give to those working musicians that are out there like they're slugging it. They got their nine to five because they got to pay bills, but they also are doing this at nights and weekends. Like, wh what are your your powerful words of wisdom? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, there is joy in playing music. What I say to everybody is stop thinking about the money and think about how much fun it is to play with your, your pals. It's Even if you're playing really club funny. dates, you know, whatever you're doing. And I also would say play locally. You know, don't think about coming to L.A. and, and busting into the music business because there isn't one. Yeah, there isn't any music business, you know, play around town, be the best band within 100 miles of, of wherever you are. I think that would be a worthy, a worthy goal and, and do it for the love. If you're doing it to get rich, don't do you're not going to, you know, do something else to get rich because you, you, that is not going to that's not your path towards towards yeah. rich, <laughs> towards a massive wealth. You know how the music business is now. It doesn't exist. So, uh, like I said, have fun with it and think locally and have a ball playing playing rock and roll with your pals. I love that. That's great. That's it, Wadi, yeah. anything to add? Well, that's about it because, I mean, when we came up, there was studio work available, but now right. everyone works out of their bedroom on a, right. on a laptop, you know, and you, you maybe go in the studio to cut the drums and then you get the hell out and you go back to your house and <laughs> and you do overdubs and, and we do the same. I mean... <laughs> You know, we, we cut our record. We went to the studio for three days, was it, Danny, I think? Three, four days, yeah. You know, wow. We cut all the tracks, and then we get out of the studio. We went to Postel's room or my room doing overdubs here or doing the vocals and overdubs at Steve's place. And uh, wow. it's a whole different world. I wouldn't know how to tell anyone to go to walk into a studio. First of all, you can't just walk into a studio anymore. I mean, right. I can't even believe that when I moved here, I was able to walk into United Western Studio and see what was going on, and no one threw me out, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I got hired. And it's, you know, there, there was no word of mouth. There is, is no word of mouth like there was then. I mean, I did a session. Someone heard me. They said, "This guy's good. Hire him." It doesn't work like that now. It's yeah. not. And get on a session first of all, and uh, it's very difficult. It, because there's so few studios now. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, the music business is, is a completely different beast. It's unrecognizable from when uh, you guys started. Um, yes, and is. Yeah, and, and I think I absolutely love what you said, Danny, about being the best band you can be within 100 miles. Like, we, we speak to local musicians uh, uh, through the Bone and Soundwaves TV, and that's it's a very inspiring thing to think about, you know. And, Start with the love. Start with the love. Not with the money. Start with the love. Yeah. I'm going to say, play music because you have to, you know. Yeah. I always say that. I always say a true musician does it because they can't not do it. Yeah. If you, can, do it. if you can do something else, do it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, yeah. very well said. I love it. <laughs> My takeaway from this, uh, this chat is really, it's all about the journey. You know, enjoy the journey. And you guys have had quite the journey so far. You got... Yes. The most amazing resumes. And I, I, for one, have to thank you for all the music that you've put out because it's been a big part of the fabric of my life um, and probably a lot of the reason why I play music on the radio. So it means a lot to me. Uh, Believe me, it was our pleasure and our joy to, to do it. So, so great. Well, I want to wrap with my favorite question. Uh, this it, it sounds simple when I spit it out, but there's a lot of heft to it. Uh, there was a film that came out, you may be familiar, almost famous in the early 2000s. And in the last, last frame of that film, the question is asked, what do you love about music? Wow. That's... Well, it's my life. It's, I've started, <laughs> I, I noticed when I was like four or five years old that I was walking around singing songs. Yeah. And I noticed that my brother wasn't. And I noticed when I met other kids, they weren't. But I wake up every day with a song in my head, whether I'm trying to write one or it's just some song I love or it's some song I don't, don't even love. Yeah. You know, you wind up sometimes singing a song you hate for hours because yeah. you can't get it out of your head. I mean, music is it's everything. It, it, you know, like I said, do it because you have to, because it's what guides my life. I mean, there's no, when I'm, when people are talking to me, I've got a fucking song going through my head. <laughs> I'm thinking of some melody that I love or some tune that I can't get enough of. And it's just, uh, it, it wins the, the competition. 
you know. Love that. <laughs> Danny, what about you? Well, it's the same thing, you know, it's, uh, music is, is, I mean, it's everything to me. It's, it's, it's corn, corny and, and a cliche to say that music is my life, but it's the case. Uh, it has been since I was a little boy. And uh, I still love it, and I still get a buzz from it, from listening to my favorite stuff. I, I still listen to the stuff I grew up with a lot, and I love it, you know. Uh, I, and I learned so much. I was able to learn so much from the great pioneers that came before uh, myself and Wadi and all of us, you know. Really? It's, it's just such a, it, it's a very deep relationship and can't be summed up very, very easily, except to say that, it, it, you know, it's my life and it's everything to me. Music is my religion, and it's it's. It's who I am. It's what I do. And that's why I asked that question, because I always get profound answers. And uh, the I, one day I'm going to edit all these answers together and just have this very, very long, beautiful, poetic uh, expression to music. That's my that's my great project. One day I will do. Well, the two of you, thank you so much for being here. This has been such a pleasure. Uh, make sure all of you watching go out. Watch Immediate Family now. Do it now. Don't turn us off. But after you watch this, <laughs> uh, go check it out. Like I said, you can find it very easily. Just Google it and you can find it on Amazon Prime and Apple TV. And uh, thank you for everything that you guys do. I appreciate you. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much. much.